I'm just gonna give it a minute or two here and let some people in, but welcome. Good to see people, or at least see your names. If you could put your names, um, your full name, or at least your first name, that way I can see who's here. I'm gonna try to make this somewhat interactive, even though it's on the web about fun. started so welcome everybody i know there are people from all over the world so wherever you are welcome i'm excited to chat with you today and hopefully uh we will get to interact with each other today and i'll give you a little more information about myself in a minute but what i'd love to do is if you are willing i would love for you to put in the chat so we've got a chat feature and a q a feature but in the chat i would love for you to just put where you are as you sit here and listen to me chat. I know some people might be in the middle of their day, some might be in the evening, uh, some might even be in the in the morning, but populate the chat on, you're from Rome, uh, I think it's Lena, uh, but where are you on this scale? So also I want you to locate yourself. So um, are you at a plus three, which would mean that you're inspired, you're ecstatic, you're elated, you're passionate, are you plus two, happy, excited, energized, eager, are you plus one, calm, content, even keeled, satisfied? Are you a minus one, fatigued, stressed, annoyed, distracted? A minus two, are you angry, disappointed, frustrated, disengaged? Are you a minus three, depressed, miserable, desperate, victimized? Where are you on this list? Pick one and, and just score yourself. So Ben, uh, I love that people are from Paris, from Rome. Let's just have people put in the chat where they are right now. Um, it'd be great to just see y'all put it in the chat and, and populate it. I'll wait just a minute. Ariel, good to see you from Switzerland. Ariel, Ben, Lena, would you guys mind putting in the chat where you are, where, where you feel right now? See if we can get some numbers. And while I wait on that, I'll share with you. I am, I'm at a plus two. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really energized. I'm really eager. I'm excited to get to know all of you. You all are in locations that I'm jealous of all over the world. It's really cool. I'm based in Washington, D.C., uh, actually at an area called Bethesda, Maryland. Um, but I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you virtually today. Ben, plus two. Good to see you, man. Um, I'm looking forward to getting to know you all. And even though this is a webinar, I can't necessarily see you. I'm hoping that we can interact with each other today and make this as interactive as a webinar can be. So I love that people are already in the chat saying, hey, this is where you're from. Ariel, thanks for putting in a plus one. And one thing I love about this states of mind chart is it's a great reminder to just be able to locate where are we, right? Simonetti, plus two, um, Aravina, if I pronounce your name wrong, I apologize, a uh, plus two as well. So it's important to know, hey, where am I? Because the reality is we're, we're still living in a pandemic. 
uh, Mark, who's in Pennsylvania, might be living in it differently than I am, uh, not too far away. And we all are having different experiences going through this crazy time. And so it's important to remind ourselves, hey, this is where I am right now. I'm actually at a minus one, or I'm at a minus two, or I'm at a minus three. So location is everything when we talk about mindset. It's we need to understand where am I and how does that impact how I show up for the people I love, for the people I work with, for strangers, whoever it might be. So I always love to start with just locating where am I? And this is a great exercise you can do with yourself. You can do it with coworkers, with family members, with friends, with roommates, whoever it might be. Locating where you are before you engage. So I always love to start my conversations there. And one of the reasons I love to start there is because we ideally are not operating as thermometers, we are actually operating as thermostats. And what we mean by that is that we can actually set our temperature. So we're all over the world on this call. There might be someone who's in terrible weather right now and someone who's in amazing weather. And you can tell I'm in the States because we're using Fahrenheit. Um, but where are you? And then how do you change the thermostat? So if you were at a minus two entering our conversation today, what can you do over the course of the hour to get yourself to a minus one? Or if you're at a minus one, what can you do to get yourself a little ab above the line? So that maybe you're at a plus one or a plus two. So what we're gonna talk about today is how you set your mind and what to do if you find yourself below that line um, in those sort of minus numbers. So a few definitions that I love to start with. Number one is this idea of set mind, which I just used. And simply put, set mind is an intentional way of thinking, an intentional way of thinking. So how are you setting your mind intentionally? Number two is this idea of mental toughness. And mental toughness is the ability to recover from mistakes and excel when performing under pressure. So why does any of this matter? And why should you listen to this guy who's wearing a black shirt, maybe thousands of miles away from where you're sitting? So a little bit about me and my background, which I realized I started talking and I wanted to get us going before I introduced myself. My background is a combination of mental performance coaching in sports psychology and executive coaching in the corporate world. So I've been really fortunate to coach executives at all different levels, all different industries. And I work with them one-on-one. -on -one. And then I also do group workshops like this in the corporate world. Additionally, my education is actually in sports psychology. So for the last 10 years, I've been working with athletes and sports teams on setting their mind and developing their mental toughness. So I've been fortunate to work with professional teams in the United States, and I actually work with a number of athletes all over the world. I, I currently work with uh, professional athletes in Italy and France. I've worked with athletes in Romania, uh, a wide range. It's one of the beauties of this technology that we're using today in this platform that I can actually have really in-depth and meaningful conversations with people all over the world. But as I said, I'm based in Washington, D.C. In, in, in an area called Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, and I'm really excited to share what I've learned along my journey with you all today and think about how this applies to you. And it might be that it applies to you in your work, in your personal life, um, in different aspects than what you see on the screen within these organizations. As we get going, I will monitor the Q&A. So if you do have a question, feel free to throw it in the chat, uh, throw it in the Q&A. The chat, you all can chat to each other and I may ask you questions where the chat is the best feature. But if you have a question for me, really use the Q&A as the place to ask me questions. And then at the end, I'll make sure we have enough time to go over any questions that end up in the Q&A. So if you have any thoughts or any answers that I'm to questions that I'm posing, throw it in the chat. Questions for me, feel free to throw it in the Q&A. So what is it that I work on and what is it that I do? So in sports, there's really three elements that you can train. There's the ta tactical and technical, which typically, in typically involves skills, X's and O's, strategy, system, scheme. Even in the corporate world, we have strategy that a company has to think about. How do we wanna show up? What are we trying to do? What are our processes? What are our systems? Do we use Salesforce? What is our CRM? Um, organizations are very tactical and technical with how they show up for their people. Then there's the physical side. And in sports, we really talk about this, but we're actually hearing it more and more in the corporate side. What are you doing as far as sleep? 
What are you doing as far as nutrition? Um, how are you doing with your exercise and your fitness? So there obviously is a physical component to sports, but there's also a physical component to the work that we do. So um, right now I've got a big thing of water. Um, I drink it before. I made sure I had a good lunch because it's I'm on Eastern Standard Time. So this is about one o'clock. Now it's about 110. Um, so what are we doing physically to make sure that we're energized to do the job that we're, we've set out to do? Then you have this other side, the mental and emotional. And that's really where I live. That's what I'm obsessed with. That's what I'm curious about. And that's my expertise. And that involves personal identity. Who are we? What is our character? How do we show up to the world? And this idea of how do we show up for ourselves and really be getting clear on who we are, what are our values, what is our character, what's our philosophy, and then what are the frameworks that we use to be our best? So that is a bit about my company and our organization. And I've got a bench of coaches that go into organizations and teach these skills either through workshops like these or through one-on-one -on -one coaching. So we either train and teach skills or we do one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is really about asking questions and discovering. So one thing I wanna say before we get started, I've never dunked a basketball on a 10 foot hoop. I've never hit a fastball that goes hundred miles an hour in baseball and I've not, never caught a touchdown in football. Um, yet I've worked with athletes in all of those areas. And Robert, I, I see that you put in the chat to share the set mind slide again. So let me go back a little bit. Um, and just go over that real quick and then we'll jump back in. So Robert, real quick, how I make the distinction between these two is set mind is an intentional way of thinking. It's really this idea of priming. It's this idea of how am I setting my mind before I go out and perform? And then mental toughness is really this ability to recover from mistakes and excel when I'm performing under pressure. So even what I just did require some agility, some mental toughness. Hey, I need to go back to that slide to make sure it's clear for Robert. That requires mental toughness. So I can do whatever I need to do to set my mind and get water and make sure I'm good. But at the end of the day, I'm gonna make a mistake over the next hour. I'm gonna either go too fast or maybe something won't land with Robert or the rest of the audience and I'll have to adjust and recover and respond. I call it snap recovery. Can you recover as quickly as you snap your fingers? And ultimately, that's where mental toughness lives. That's where toughness lies. Can we recover as quickly as we snap our fingers? So Robert, hope that was helpful for you. Um, and just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Set mind and mental toughness. Those are two distinctions that I think are important. So moving forward, and what I was getting to here is, even though I've never caught a touchdown in professional football or hit a 95 mile an hour fastball or dunked a basketball. I've worked with people in all of these industries. And so I'm not here to tell you how to do your job. You might work in finance, you might work in real estate, insurance, you might work in whatever industry you're in, you might be a parent, uh, whatever it is that you do and you perform at, I'm not here to tell you how to do your job. What I am here to talk to you about is this framework that I've created about how you think about both preparation and performance and how we can apply what I call shifting your mind to whatever it is that you're performing at. And real quick, when I say performance, I really, I'm gonna get in the definition, but I really believe that we are all performers in one way, shape or form. We all find ourselves having to perform whatever it is that we do for a living. You may not be a professional athlete, but if you look deep into what your job is, you are a performer. I'm a parent. I have two small kids, a four-year-old and a five-year-old. And I will tell you my four-year-old, my wife and I have to perform with her. We have to be very thoughtful about how we set our mind before we approach her and that we have the patience and persistence to have mental toughness when addressing her. And she tests our buttons this morning. She messed with her brother and we had to be very intentional with how we showed up for her. So we'll talk a little bit more about performance in a minute. What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna show this video. And the video is about Kobe Bryant. So if you're unfamiliar with Kobe, he tragically passed away in a helicopter accident last year. Uh, but prior to that, Kobe is, one, is considered one of the best professional basketball players of all time. Um, he's also really well known for how he set his mind and his mental toughness. So what you're gonna hear is actually Kobe talking about Beyonce and how Beyonce sets her mind and how Beyonce brings this element of mental toughness to her performance. 
So Kobe's going to start by talking about Beyonce. Then you're going to hear from a guy named Laurent Prophet. Laurent played in, in the National Basketball Association. He played in professional basketball for a number of years and played alongside Kobe Bryant. And I have a podcast called Intentional Performers. And I interviewed Laurent Prophet on my podcast and I asked him about Kobe Bryant. So Laurent is going to share a story about Kobe. And then the last part of this video is Beyonce. And Beyonce and the people around Beyonce are going to share how Beyonce sets her mind and how she has the mental toughness to perform on some of the biggest stages that the world has to offer. So in summary, you're going to get Kobe talking about Beyonce. You're going to get Laurent talking about Kobe and then Beyonce talking about Beyonce. And as you're listening to these people speak, I want you to think about what is similar to you as a performer. What are the similarities that exist? How do you bring some of the elements that they're discussing into your world, into your life? And I'd love if there are things that are resonating with you, if there are things that are landing with you, I'd love it if you put it in the chat. And so that I can just see, hey, this is something that, that is, is important for me in my role as a performer. And let's see if we can populate the chat with what you're noticing, what you're observing, if there are any trends or any tendencies that you're hearing from Kobe and Beyonce. And so I'm gonna play the video and, and let's just listen along. And I'd love to see the chat lit up as you listen to them on themes that you're noticing, what you're hearing and how it may stay with you. Beyonce is the same, same thing. Really? After a performance, she's immediately on her laptop re-watching the performance. No way. Yes, seeing how to do things better. What could we have done differently? Right. I mean, it's, it's just it's it's, a, it's an obsessiveness that comes along with it. You want things to be as perfect as they can be, understanding that nothing is ever perfect. But the challenge is try to get them as perfect as they can be. Mm -hmm. And what can you do? It's in your control. So control what you can. Yeah. I can watch film all day long. It's going to help me get better. Yes. I remember we were playing Seattle and he came in at halftime and I think he was six for 19 from the field. And I was like, you know, trying to be the good teammate. I'm like, hey, man, you know, it's going to be all right. You're going to get it going. You know, we trust you. We know you're going to get it going. And he looked at me and he said, prop, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> he said, I worked too hard for the ball not to go in. <laughs> and sure enough, in the second half, he went off and we won the game and he had 40 something. And after the game, I'm sitting there going, he was really serious about that. He was not concerned that he was six for 19 because he really believed all the work ethic and the preparation that I've done, eventually at some point, the ball is going to go in the basket. Working with Beyonce is interesting. She can be a very benevolent dictator. She can also be a wonderful collaborator. And through the uh, process, you meet both sides. He has such an ambition to be perfect and to be the best that you just get swept along in that. I can't help it. <laughs> I, I definitely collaborate and I respect people that I work with, but I dreamt the performance before it happened. We went through so many different drafts. You know, we made changes every day and we tweaked every day and we wanted to perfect every day. It's my passion. It's why I breathe. It's what I dream. I would really strive to, to keep perfecting and getting better and knowing that I always have room to grow. I feel like part of the reason I rehearse so much and part of the reason I study everything is so I can completely let go and relax. So I'm not in my head and I'm confident. Real life Beyonce is very shy and retiring, but when she's on stage, she morphs into this queen bee dragon slayer who's there to make the crowd go wild and she's going to shut it down. The last note of Halo, I was like, oh my God, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I'm so grateful. I just felt overwhelmed and tears and, you know, it was a beautiful night. <laughs> So thanks to Jen who, who put some stuff in the chat, some comments in the chat. So I'm going to read those. And if you have something else that you noticed, was there a pattern? Was there something that landed and, and resonated with you about how you show up for whatever it is that you deem to be a performance? Uh, but Jen put focusing on what's in your control. So you hear 
Kobe talking about you can control what you can control. And it is a cliche, but it's often very true for performers that there are things that are in their control. There are things that are out of their control. Welcome to 2020, 2021, right? I think we all now realize that there are elements of our environment, no matter if we wanna set the temperature to whatever we wanna set it to, there's still gonna be elements that are out of our control, whether it's you have to wear a mask or not wear a mask. There is uh, lockdowns and quarantines, um, a vaccine, and do you, do you get it? Do you not get it? Are people getting it? Or do they don't? Is your business able to open? Are the schools open? There are elements to this world and to this life that are out of our control. And that's why it's so essential that if there are things that are in our control, that we direct our attention to it. And I use that phrase a lot, direct attention, because the definition of focus is simply directed attention. So are we directing our attention to everything that are, that's out of our control or are we directing our attention to what's in our control? And that's why you hear someone like Kobe suggesting that we focus or we direct our attention to controlling the elements that are in our control rather than directing our attention to what's out of our control. Also, Jen mentioned work ethic. Both of them use the term passion or obsessiveness to perfect, and they use that term perfect uh, their work ethic. And so when I heard this interview and I heard many other interviews like this and I studied everything from musicians to athletes, to actors, to doctors, to business people, I started to notice a pattern. And once I saw that pattern, Beyonce. it was really hard for me to unsee it. And if I really broke down Beyonce's philosophy, what I heard from her is I'm gonna be humble in preparation and I'm gonna be confident in performance. So I'm going to get feedback. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow. But when I step on stage, you even heard that other person say, she's going to shut it down. She's a dragon slayer. She morphs into something else. She shifts her mind from her preparation humility to a confident performance mind. She talked about dreaming the performance before it happened in preparation. She's visualizing it. She's seeing it. She's thinking about the future. But then when she's on stage, she talks about feeling grateful and even being overwhelmed in the moment. She's letting it soak in. She's being present. Even as I do this right now, I'm looking at a green dot on my screen. <laughs> I wish I could see your faces, trust me. But my ability to stay here with you will determine if I'm able to connect with you, will determine if I'm able to go back to the previous slides to make sure I'm serving Robert. That's my job is to be where my feet are for this time that we have together. Time is the most precious commodity we have in this universe. It's the most precious commodity. I am so excited to have your time. I don't take it lightly. It's a big deal. Some of you, it's the evening. Some of you, it's the middle of the day. Whatever time it is, I need to be present. I use that phrase, be where my feet are. If you study a lot of elite performers like Beyonce, you'll notice that they practice being present. It's a practice. In addition to that, there's this idea of being perfectionistic. And perfectionism can go awry. We can be too perfectionistic. I've worked with plenty of clients who bring their perfectionism into their performance. But I will tell you, in working with elite performers in business and sport, CEOs, uh, professional athletes, perfectionism is a part of their process. They just leverage it in preparation like Beyonce and Kobe do. And they are adaptable in performance. And use me as an example, and I wouldn't claim to be on Beyonce or Kobe's level, but when I probably went too fast on that slide with the mental toughness and Robert said, hey, can you go back? I need to be agile and adaptable. It's not about perfecting our time together today. Now, before we got on here, did I make sure that I was perfecting everything? Did I come on early with Katarina from A Small World to make sure that everything was working? Did I make sure that I knew exactly what I was gonna do? I watched a video of what these were like previously. I tried to perfect everything. And I understand that a performance is never gonna be perfect. So that's where I need to be agile, flexible, adaptable. And I will argue that most performances are wicked environments. And what I mean by wicked is there's so many unknown factors. We don't know what's gonna happen once we get on stage or once we get on the court or once I'm interacting with my daughter. It's unknown. There's only so much I can control. So if I'm in a wicked unknown environment, it is essential 
that I am agile, flexible, adaptable when I am performing. And once again, I look at the last year and it has been a wicked environment for many. Look at a small world. <laughs> like their business is predicated on you all traveling and connecting and coming together and we are doing our best. But I think we could all agree if you're here, you are craving a desire to connect with each other and to travel. I, I booked my first flight in a year this weekend and I'm so excited about it, I gotta tell you. So if we're in a wicked environment and we're not adaptable and we are perfectionistic, we're gonna run into some barriers and some walls because life isn't designed for perfection. If we live long enough, we are going to face some tragedy. We are gonna have some hardship. Nobody goes through life unscathed in that regard. So it really is about being agile if you think about life as sort of this performance. So what am I even talking about and why does this matter? I saw the, these concepts and these frameworks and these polarities and I saw them everywhere. And I started working with golfers and salespeople and CEOs and sports coaches. And we started talking about, well, what do you need in preparation? And what do you need in performance? And something emerged that just smacked me over the head and grabbed my attention. The best performers in the world shift their mind in preparation and in performance. And greatness is not necessarily about what you do, but about when you do it. What I mean by that is it really matters when you are a certain way. And if we are the wrong way in the wrong environment, it can really backfire and it can cause us to feel stuck and it can limit our potential. So what I started to do is I started working with these clients. I consider myself a coach. I do most of my work one-on-one -on -one and then I do these types of workshops. So I'm really fortunate. I get to be in the weeds with all kinds of amazing people in diverse industries and fields. And I would just start having them write a list. What is your mind and preparation on one side? And what is, your line, what is your mind in performance on the other side? And we started creating. And what I started to realize were there were about 30 or 40 of these shifts that these people needed to be different. And so the idea that you need to be a certain way all the time, I was finding to be very inaccurate. And so there's this power of and that we don't often talk about. We say, you need to be this way. You need to be that way. Okay. Well, when? It depends when I need to be a certain way. So the power of when and the power of it depends really was speaking to me and my clients. So once they started to get clarity on where they needed to be in preparation and where they needed to be in performance, it helped them unlock and free them up to let their body do what they had trained their body to do. Or in the corporate world, the salesperson to do what they were competent at and what they knew how to do. And so when that starts to happen, you start to notice that with your clients, that's when I said, I need to write a book about this. <laughs> and so I've been coaching for about 10 years and I spent the last four years writing this book. And so the book is called Shift Your Mind. It's about nine mental shifts to thrive in both preparation and performance. And it came out in October. And ever since then, it's been amazing to get feedback from people about how these shifts and how this framework is helping them with both preparation and performance. And I've received notes from people all over the world, every type of industry. Um, so it's really been very, very rewarding and gratifying to share this framework. And to be honest, before the book, I spent most of my time just working with people. I, I didn't feel the need to share with the universe, but this framework is really something that's helped me as a father, as a husband, as a coach, as a speaker, there's a, a, in, in the sports that I play at a, a very low level, um, it, it helps me in a lot of different areas. So I wrote it because I wanted to help other people. And even though I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching and speaking, I felt like a book could really guide people on how to set their mind and then how to shift it when it wasn't where it needed to be. So what are the nine shifts? We have humble in preparation and arrogant in performance. I know that word arrogant can really rub people the wrong way. And I get it. I've worked for an arrogant boss. I know what it's like to be around arrogant people. And as you're reading these words, there's a couple of things I want you to keep in mind. Number one, arrogance without humility is toxic. 
So I'm not suggesting that you're arrogant all the time. What I'm suggesting is if you do the humble preparation, that once you step between the lines and you're performing, you have to have this unshakable belief that you know what you're doing, conviction. But the conviction has to come from curiosity and preparation, has to come from humility, getting feedback, learning, growing, developing. That's what causes us to earn the right to have this unshakable belief in ourselves. And so I go through all of these words and I define them. And I will also say this, some of these shifts may not apply to your work or where you see yourself as a performer. And that's okay too. I didn't write this book saying, these are the nine mental shifts. Do these nine mental shifts and you will be successful. I don't believe that to be true. What I believe is that if you are intentional, thoughtful, mindful of how you are setting your mind in preparation and how you are setting your mind in performance, that you can unlock something in you and perform better. And some of your shifts might not be on here. They might be completely different. As I said, I had 30 or 40. These were the nine that we felt had the most data, the most research. I witnessed them the most with my clients. So these were the nine that we focused on, but they are not the nine. They are not the nine. Other ones that we talked about, work and preparation. It matters to have a work ethic. Jen point, pointed out, Kobe and Beyonce talking about hard work. And we have to play. One of the things I like about a small world is there's a play component to this organization. Success without joy, it's failure. It, it does not, like we shouldn't live our life without joy. I think sometimes we often try to focus on maximizing. I need to get eight hours of sleep. I need to meditate for 20 minutes a day. I should journal, I should read. I need to eat clean. I need to exercise for an hour. We have all these things that we feel like we have to do that sometimes we forget to smile <laughs> and play. And having a play ethic to me, especially in performance, we play sports. If you go to Broadway in New York City, it's a play. If you go to a concert, they play instruments. We have to remember to play. And the way we play in performance is by putting the work in in preparation. Future in preparation, Beyonce is saying, I visualized it, I dreamt the performance before it even happened. And then we have to be adaptable, which I already hit on. Analysis and preparation. We live in a world today that is very data heavy. There's value in data. There's value in analyzing. And there comes a time where we have to rely on instinct. We have to rely more on our gut than our head. And when we're performing, often instinct is what allows us to free ourselves up. Experimenting in preparation. We need to tinker. Beyonce talked about trying new things, experimenting, and then trusting process and performance. This is how I show up. I'm gonna trust in my ability and the process with which I take when I'm performing. Uncomfortable in preparation. We often use the term, be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Really helpful in preparation. You wanna grow, go toward discomfort. Discomfort is really typically where we grow. And if you're performing, get comfortable. Whatever you need to do to feel and be comfortable, have a routine that allows you to get into your comfort level. Fear, a big word. We have to say, don't be fearful. Okay, I'd argue fear can be helpful in preparation. If I didn't have any fear about getting this right, I wouldn't have been as prepared. A healthy dose of fear can be really helpful and crippling when we are performing. So we need to shift out of that and go towards fearlessness. Let go of the fear. Don't worry about the outcome. Go for it. Be bold. Fearlessness in performance. And the last one, which I think is a really, um, a really big, big one for parents. And I, I talk about myself in the book on this front. We need to be selfish in preparation and selfless in performance. There's an old leadership adage that says, if you're on the airplane, and the plane is going down, they tell you to put your oxygen mask on first before helping others. And I really think that's true. Fill your cup up first and give the overflow and the reserves to people that you care about. But if we're, if we're acting from an empty cup or we don't have our oxygen, we can't help anybody. And so I really believe that we need to be selfish in preparation. We need to take care of everything we need. We often call them divas in the entertainment industry, but get everything you need so that you can serve others in performance, so that you can help others and bring people up. So those are the shifts that 
I talk about in the book. Once again, there are many, many more. And if you have some, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, Ives, and once again, if I'm not pronouncing it, if we had our faces, I would ask for you to help me with pronunciation. I'm sorry, I'm terrible at it. Um, you mentioned in the chat, it reminds you of Outliers from Malcolm Gladwell. The left side is a 10,000 hour journey. I, I think that's a really cool way to think about it. Um, I think Gladwell popular, popularized 10,000 hours from a guy named Anders Ericsson, uh, who is a professor at Florida State. And one of the big things that Anders talked about that often gets lost in Gladwell's argument is this idea of being deliberate, being very deliberate in your preparation. And what's actually cool about you bringing up that question is it actually speaks to where we're going to go next, which is around this idea of practice. And I'm going to make a little bit of a distinction that Gladwell doesn't make or Erickson doesn't make. I think there's three components here. There's the preparation, there's the practice, and there's the performance. So what do I actually mean by that? For me, preparation is the action or process of making ourselves ready and competent. So great preparation is that left-hand side. It's all of those areas that perhaps Gladwell would say are deliberate. It is really about this idea of improvement, growing, developing, learning. And then performance is about executing. It's about the execution of actions that will be evaluated in some way. And that last piece of evaluation is really key. Because at the end of the day, we do evaluate in this world if it's a performance. People do care about how you perform, the outcome at your work. If you're not performing well, there are consequences to it. There are consequences to your bank account. So we need to be aware of it is an evaluation. There is judgment involved with a performance, whether that's a standing ovation or a paycheck. There is an evaluation in some way. So what do we mean by practice? To me, a great practice is the combination of both preparation and performance. And so what does that look like? And this is where maybe I'd push back on the idea of 10,000 hours because yes, it's deliberate, but what are we, how are we actually thinking about setting our mind within that work? Because sometimes we wanna be in that preparation mode when we are practicing. We need to learn, grow, develop. And then other times we need to practice our performance mind. We actually need to practice what it's like to be arrogant or selfless in performance. And if we practice it, we're gonna work that muscle of the performance mind. So in sports, you see this all the time. There are times when they practice on their footwork and really make sure that they perfect everything. And then there's other times in a practice where they go to the time and the score and they just roll the ball out and say, you got to adapt, you got to find a way. So in sports, they actually do a good job. They don't do a good job of everything, but they do do a good job of practicing. And I think there's something to be learned there for all of us and to think about well, how do I practice? How often am I in the performance mind? And how often am I in the preparation mind? And I argue you actually want both in a practice. And so that it's a big, big element to fulfilling your potential because if you just work the preparation mind, when you get to a performance, it will be unfamiliar. And if you just work the performance mind, you won't learn, you won't grow, you won't develop. So the idea is really that you need both of these things. You know, I got a lot of books behind me, including my book, and I love reading. I love reading about psychology. But one of the things that I think psychology doesn't always get right is this idea of polarity. And so this idea that we actually need to be different parts of ourselves at different times. That's why if you've ever taken the Myers-Briggs or the DISC or something called the Hogan, a, a, an assessment tool that's looking at your personality, it often lacks nuance or context and often doesn't get into this idea of, well, sometimes I'm introverted and sometimes I'm extroverted. Well, sometimes I'm this way, sometimes I'm that way. And I think for us, what we really wanna step into is this idea of being intentional for the environment that we're stepping into. So I wanna do an exercise with you all. And once again, usually this works better when we can all see each other. And so I'm just gonna hope that you're with me as I walk you through this. And what we're gonna do is you're gonna just take your hand and you're gonna place it on your belly. And what I'd like for you to do is you're just gonna take an inhale through your nose. And if you feel comfortable closing your eyes and you're in a safe environment, feel free to close your eyes. You're gonna inhale through the nose. And when you inhale through the nose, let's expand the belly. So we're gonna inhale through the nose and expand the belly. Then we're gonna exhale out through the mouth.
and ideally the belly will contract. So we're gonna inhale through the nose, the belly will expand. We're gonna exhale out through the mouth, belly will contract. And one of the things to notice when you listen to me is that the exhale is emphasized. So it's almost like you're blowing out birthday candles. You inhale through the nose, and then you really want that exhale to be long. And we're just gonna do this together. And I'm gonna go silent. I'm gonna take you through the first three breaths. I'm gonna go silent. And then as you're doing those breaths, I'm gonna come back in. I would love it if you kept your eyes closed and just listen to my voice as I direct you to the second part of this exercise. So the first part, you're just gonna take a breath with me. Feel free to close your eyes and inhale through your nose, your belly will expand. Exhale out through the mouth, belly will contract. Inhale through the nose, belly will expand. Exhale out through the mouth, belly will contract. Inhale through the nose, belly will expand. Exhale out through the mouth, belly will contract. Find your own tempo, find your own pace. And if you have any thoughts pop in your head, just bring your attention back to the breath. I'm gonna go silent and feel free to continue the breathing until I come back on. Next, I'd like for you to put your hand on your heart. I want you to just imagine a happy moment in your life. Just sit in that happy moment for a little bit. Whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and open your eyes. And I'd love for people to just put in the chat anything that they experienced or what they felt, either when they had their hand on their belly or their hand on their heart. And I'll go first as hopefully some of you will be brave enough to populate the chat. So when I first did this exercise and went to the heart, I was surprised at where my mind went to. Uh, it actually went to my first date with my now wife. And it's weird because we've got two kids, we've been married and we've had these big moments in our life that we certainly have celebrated. But I go back to that moment where we're just eating a burger and fries and having a beer and we're young, we're in our early twenties and it's just the two of us. And it's a memory that I don't think about all the time, but it really makes me smile. It really gets me into that play mode because it was a time in my life that was very playful and very joyful. And for me, at least, uh, I can get into the week and my work and the kids and pandemic, <laughs> and I can sometimes lose sight of the joy and I can sometimes forget about the play. And for me, at least, I made a declaration years ago that the goal in life for me is not to feel happy all the time. The goal is to feel alive as much as possible. And once again, when I think about a small world, it is about creating experiences and events and moments that make people feel alive. And I think at the end of the day, that dinner with my now wife, I felt very alive. And I don't wanna lose that even as I 
lose some hair and and change what I look like and what I experience, I still want to have that play. And then back to just focusing on the breath and the belly is this idea of our ability to be present and to be silent or quiet and just be with ourselves. And we live in a connected world now where like I had to turn this thing off for this presentation because I know it's gonna just make noises the entire time I'm chatting with you, <clears throat> which makes it really hard for us to be with our cells and be where our feet are. And so practicing both our ability to be present and our ability to tap into play are, are really helpful if we're trying to tap into our performance mind. Jen, I really appreciate you putting your thoughts in the chat. And you said, with my hand on my heart, I felt overwhelmed with gratitude for the moment immediately after my son was born, how he was placed on my chest for skin to skin contact. The world stood still. I'm getting chills as I read this. I usually feel anxious to be elsewhere but that was a moment where I felt fully present without a need to be anywhere else. How beautiful is that, right? <clears throat> and we all have those moments, those joy, joyful moments. Nobody goes through life without joy. Even if you think somebody is a sad, curmudgeon, miserable person, trust me, they've had joy in their life. Just like those that you think are happy-go-lucky, they've had sadness and sorrow as well. It's the human experience. But too often, similar to you, Jen, like we go through life and we don't stand still. We don't reflect on those moments that are playful, that are joyful. And so I'd encourage all of you to think about how you can bring the heart into your life and the ability to just be present, be present with your breath. So with that, I want to start to wind down. And now would be a great time to put any questions that you have in the Q&A. We've got about 10, 12 minutes left. Uh, if you have questions, throw them in the q and I'll be happy to answer them. And also, I'd love for you to populate the chat and locate where you are now. Not the city that you're in, but where are you state of mind-wise? Are you a plus three? Are you a plus two? Are you a plus one? Are you a minus one? Wherever you are, it's okay. We're not designed to be above the line all the time. There are things that can happen that can cause us to go below the line, but we wanna be intentional about setting our minds, setting that thermostat to make sure that we're above the line as often as, as we can be. So I'd love for you to put in the chat and locate yourself. Where are you? Just put a number, um, would love to see those and then start filling the uh, Q and A with questions and I'll, I'll be happy to answer any that come through. While you're doing that, I wanna just close by saying, and I'm really grateful to be here. I'm really glad to be here. Glad to be here is a phrase used by the Blue Angels. So if you're unfamiliar by the Blue Angels, they are American uh, military and they, they fly these fighter jets all over the world and put on shows. And they're really remarkable to watch. They do flips. Uh, and Victoria, thanks for putting in the chat, by the way, wherever you are is where you, where you are. So I appreciate you putting in the chat that you're minus one, thank you. Um, and these Blue Angels, they, they put on shows all over the world. And it's really hard to be a blue angel. They train really hard. They give feedback to each other. It is a difficult and challenging job. And they have this mantra that they use where they say, glad to be here. And even though it's hard and it's difficult and maybe they're at a minus one or maybe a minus two or maybe a minus three, they always wanna remind themselves that they're glad to be here and that they have this gratitude. And so if we can remind ourselves, hey, I'm glad to be here, and hopefully you are glad to be here for the last 45 minutes or so. And I will tell you, I'm extremely glad to be here, and I'm optimistic and hopeful that maybe I can meet you all somewhere in the world sometime soon. Um, but I'm really grateful to be here and for this opportunity. As I said, time is our greatest commodity. So I don't take it lightly. I think glad to be here is just a really great phrase that we can use uh, for ourselves and for each other. Additionally, uh, if you wanna get the book, you can get it anywhere books are sold. Amazon is usually the easiest from a global perspective uh, to get the book. It's also available on audio at Audible and you can get the e-copy at Amazon as well. And then I'm a big Twitter guy. So if you like Twitter, head over there and you can follow me at Brian Levinson. Would love to interact with you. The podcast, which I mentioned earlier, is called Intentional Performers. 
Uh, I interview all kinds of different people. Um, the next episode comes out tomorrow. It's about this woman who went through a lot of trauma in her life, uh, was physically, mentally, emotionally abused, uh, married three times and had issues with all three husbands along the way. And she has four kids and she decided um, that one day they would build a house together. And so her name's Kara and Kara decided we're gonna build a house as a family from start to finish. So they were the electricians, the plumbers, and they built it with their own hands. So she's our guest tomorrow and, and she's pretty incredible. Um, so intentional performers, you can listen to that anywhere um, where you get your podcast. And then LinkedIn is a place that I also love to interact. So if you wanna connect with me on LinkedIn, would love to, to connect with you there. And then lastly, we have a newsletter. Uh, I have a newsletter that I send out once a week. It comes out on Wednesday, so it'll actually be out tomorrow. The theme tomorrow that I'm talking about is around values. And then I also share uh, articles that I'm reading, the podcast that I sent out that week, and then just random thoughts as well. So we actually have a poll that we're gonna run. So if you want to opt into that, we're just gonna put this poll out right now. Technology these days is pretty remarkable. So if you want to be on that newsletter, you can just hit yes. We'll add you to it. If you find my stuff annoying, just hit the unsubscribe button and I won't add anybody onto it unless they've opted in here. So we'll just leave that open. Feel free to say yes, if it's something that you'd like to get once again, once a week on Wednesdays and tomorrow's is around values. And then you get articles, videos, all kinds of other good stuff. So that's the newsletter. How do we do? Uh, Katarina, I think we're pretty good. We got like eight minutes. So any questions for me, feel free to, to throw it into the Q&A and I'd be happy to answer it. And if you wanna put it in the chat, if that's easier for you, I'm also happy to answer questions there. Um, and yeah, it, it, we don't have any in the Q&A right now. So if you have one, we'd be grateful. I love questions and um, yeah, feel free to also just answer the poll whenever, whenever you're ready. And uh, other than that, I'll just sit for, you guys have me for the next five minutes. So I'm happy to sit here and hang in. Uh, and if you have a question, just feel free to, to throw it my way. I can play music too. <laughs> and thank you for, for everybody also for putting in the chat. I am seeing uh, Mark and Robert and Vez and, Jen, thank you. Thank you for participating. Really appreciate it. Ariel, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So if we don't have any questions, I think Katarina, you want to just uh, close here? I know I see that they've got the, the earth <laughs> uh, logo there. Yes, how you wish we, we can close. All right. Thank you all for being here. All the best on, on all of your, oh, hey, there we go, Ariel, there we go. All right, so we got a question, so I'll, I'll answer. Ariel, thank you. Um, any thoughts on motivation during long running projects? It's a really good question and I think it's an important question. So when I think about motivation, I often think about purpose and I think about getting really clear on, on what is your purpose. And to me, if you have a long running project, you need to constantly remind yourself of why you're doing it. And so one of the things I do with my clients all the time is I have them write their name in the middle of a circle and draw lines out from the circle and list reasons why they're doing it. So if you have a long project that you're working on and it's hard to stay the course and stay motivated, you really want to define why it is that you're even doing it. Um, so for me, the book, for example, uh, that was a four year project, decently long um, and there were days where I did not want to write. There were days where I didn't feel like doing it. And I constantly went back to my mission, which is to help others unlock potential and see possibility so that they can enjoy success. And I knew that the book was going to give me an opportunity to help people unlock potential and see new possibilities and ultimately help them enjoy success. And so for me and for my clients, I think what often leads to burnout is when we lose sight of our purpose and we lose sight of why we do what we do. So that would be where I would go, Ariel, is to really go get clear on why you do it. And then of course you need to put systems and processes in place to ensure that you're not always making a motivational decision. Like we're not always thinking about why we brush our teeth every day, it becomes a habit and we just do it because we know that it's good for us. 
So if you have a lo long running project that you know is good for you, you also want to think about the power of habits and James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, gets into that. The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg is another good resource. So certainly how we show up and the habits with which we show up can also dictate how we perform in a project. So for my book, there were times where I set deadlines and I said, hey, it's not gonna be perfect, by, but by this date, I need to have a chapter done. And by this date, I need to have the audio recording done. And by this date, we need to select a title. So for me, I love forcing functions and I think it's important to have forcing functions in our lives. So my newsletter, for example, it's weekly. My podcast is weekly. Um, the way I onboard clients, so I do one-on-one -on -one coaching for executives. Every six months, I onboard 10 executives. So our next one is July. So right now, I'm currently filling my 10 spots. And I've got a few more that are going to get filled in the next couple of months. But I create these forcing functions to ensure that I show up the way that I need to show up for, for me and, and for my business as well. Um, so those are thoughts that I have. One is on the, the why we do it and two are on the, the habits with which we show up. So um, great question and, and grateful that you that you answered it. So thank you for that. Um, any other questions where, where I think, yeah, we still got a few minutes. You all have me, I don't have anything for another 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm, I'm good, I created the space. So. Um, I'll hang in and obviously if people want to drop, feel free. But if you have any questions for me, just throw it in the chat, throw in the Q&A. And um, for those of you that responded to the poll, thank you. We will uh, we'll close it and, and um, here we go. So thank you. Thank you for, uh, for participating. All right. Thank you all for being here. I think we're going to close. Uh, Katarina, thank you for all your help. See you all soon. Uh, hopefully it becomes a much smaller world very, very soon. Take care, everyone. Bye.